there in YouTube land. Welcome back. Today we thought it would be fun considering this is the, you know, Irish St. Patrick's season. Yeah. That we do a little discussion of the folklore of Irish vampires and dark fae. Why are they both together? Because they overlap tremendously in legend. It's almost impossible I mean, to separate the creatures from each other. Yeah. And we're going to get into specifics as to why. Yeah. <laughs> so, bear with us. Bear with us. We have some notes. And, you know, we're not going to be get reading a Coke. Yeah. <laughs> and try and keep this as straight as we're keeping it, which isn't 100% that straight. No. And if you really want a good source on dark fairies and vampires and lore, go with Bob Curran. Bob Curran is great. He has written numerous books on a variety of different folklore creatures, oh, yeah. as well as like cataloging different folk tales, and he's just a great folklorist. I have to say, his his artist that does all the illustrations, Ian Daniels, very good too. Just beautiful artwork, and Ian it Daniels is. also did a vampire terror deck, which is he gorgeous. Did. It's beautiful. So check, check that out. out. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to start with the vampires, and then you'll see how they mix in with the Dark Fae in Ireland. Because this is complicated. Pretty much they're all related, so here we go. Yeah. <laughs> so, the general name for vampire in Ireland is the Dergdul, which is sort of related to... Okay, so here's where we get into some complex stuff. So, during the Potato Famine, people would, like cut the necks of cows and stuff and mix the blood with mm -hmm. like oats and things so they'd have something to eat. People were starving to death, they were trying to survive while not killing all the animals, and so on and so forth. And that was a very old practice from ancient days yes. near with horses and cattle. So, so in later times go. during the potato famine, there were some people that just got so used to drinking blood that they never stopped and kind of got addicted to it. Yeah. So loosely they became known as Derg Duel, even though they weren't supernatural by any means. They were just kind of addicted to drinking blood, essentially, yeah. at that point. So you got to separate that from the ancient folk tale of the Dark Bull. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> now we're separating this out from the human. Now we step into the supernatural. Yes. So the Dark Bull, traditionally, is an apparition that drinks blood, which, you know, is kind of a known thing for vampires. But, okay, this is where we get into, like, combinations of things. Mm -hmm. Cormac McCarthy, who is known as like the head puka or the king of the puka. Puka are these supernatural beings that have a mouthful of teeth, also known as red caps. They can shape shift and they, you know, feel in the blood of people and they have a mouthful of like very sharp teeth. Right. But they're also considered dark bull because they're blood drinkers, which makes them Irish vampires Sort Even, of. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> now you get into some of the uh, calamities yeah. that we've run into. Yeah. So, underneath the heading of, you know, the Derg Duel, there's also a creature called a Marbeo, which is translated as the Night Walking Dead. Which Cormac McCarthy and a few other figures that are known as Puka or Derg Duel are also considered. Marbeo, except for the Marbeo, is also the name of a female ancient fairy who drinks blood. Right. <laughs> so then we move into the specific dark fairy lore, and you can see how all this is kind of amalgamated together. Now, with the dark fairy lore, you kind of will shift over into that, talking about the dark fairies who drink blood. We're up in County Kerry. Yeah. In Ireland at a castle that was reported to have been found, but its location was never revealed. Um, it is the Castle of Blood Visage or mm -hmm. Visage. Um, supposedly and allegedly the home of some of these blood drinking dark fae. But the person that allegedly found it and was going to reveal it. Never did so. Because he disappeared. <laughs> Guess they got him. When we talk about some of the dark fairies, 
Mm. We're talking about the she, the high elves, the unseelie court. So kind of that darker court, not yes. the seely court, which could also be very trickster. So don't don't think that they're the nice ones. They're not good and bad. No. Dark and yeah, light means their different things. things. Yeah. Um, we get into one of the most famous known, which is everybody knows her. She's the banshee, mm -hmm. and she kind of overlaps in a couple of areas. Now everybody knows the banshee as the woman who wails prior to a death in the family. What we also don't know is that in some legends, they have her as kind of this apparition, ghost, vampiric style, misty figure that comes in. And she is allegedly either an older family member that has already passed and has come back, or she's just attached to that family until she collects the one who is going to die. Then we get into kind of that dark and light leprechauns. Yeah. And we're not talking about the movie. No. However, the movie is more accurate as to what they are allegedly like. Yes. Um, everybody thinks like happy, jolly, you know, little dude sitting on the pot of gold. Pot of gold. Going to give you his treasure. When by folklore, they're quite grouchy and violent and not so much nice. No. Um,. And then we kind of go into a different realm mm -hmm. with the Tuatha de Danann legends in Ireland, and they can be both unseely, dark fairies, and well as seely. They were thought to be the forefathers of the fairies um, by some legends. They were quasi supernatural, but some of them also were reported to hunt down humans and drink blood. So now we get that overlap again. Yeah. So we have. Fairies, who would be considered their duel. Yeah. <laughs> and then we get into more of your legends about, and I know people are, you guys are probably familiar with this, the Wild Hunt, or more specifically the Host of the Hunt. And they were made up of a variety of not only your spectral hounds, also associated with vampiric war, they also were made up of the Host, which were the ghosts of the dead that they were collecting. And the people they ran over across the way. And yes, it is, you know, ride, hide, or die. Mm -hmm. So, that's kind of our small foray into Irish <laughs> vampiric folklore that overlaps with Dark Fae. So, I mean, basically, from this you can kind of get the generalization that Dark Fae and Irish vampires are the same thing. Yeah. Basically. I mean, th there's so much overlap there's that... There's an overlap to them, so... There's no, like, specific, de like, separation between the two. And it was thought that Bram Stoker gained a little bit of inspiration from all of this, you know, These folklore. legends to write Dracula, because yeah. while he did take the ideas of the folklore specifically to, like, Romanian reason regions and the Strigoi to give Dracula his specific attributes... The things like the little, like, homage to the dead at the side of the road as travelers would see, mm -hmm. were seen in Ireland as well. So he had this connection to be able to see between the folklore of his homeland and the folklore of the Eastern European mountains and combine it together to create his atmospheric novel. For Dracula. Yeah. Because it's, it's a good mix of... You know, a lot of forward Romanian vampiric lore, but there's an underlying vein of dark Irish fairies. Yeah. So, we hope you had fun with this little foray into vampiredom. <laughs> look up things. It's fun. Yeah, I you mean, know, and definitely look it. at Ian Daniels' art, because yes. it's just gorgeous. It's amazing. It is. Truly. So, so. comment down below with what your favorite... Irish vampiric figure is. Let us know. Until next time. Bye! Bye.